and it starts now. One hour, I'm hoping to get through it faster. However, I was sent a thing that said it was the one hour, no, the two hour divine principle, part two, and it has 283 slides. I'm like, what? That's what, that's like uh, five slides a minute. <laughs> And so, of course, I added my own. This appears to be the projector, so don't think that you need glasses. It's something in the projector. It's not on my screen, so it's the projector. Okay, so this is the Providence of Restoration. It's part two. It has six chapters. Okay, to recap, I want to give the, the, the recap of things I think are important for part one. Heavenly Parent is a God of love. Okay? Two, the expression of love requires relationship with somebody else. Okay. Three, our universe is a visible, substantial manifestation of relationships that fulfill love. Four, the manifestation has internal and external. Okay. And the uh, internal... Mm -hmm. The internal purpose is subject, okay, and is driven by heart. So we need to have the internal purpose of heart, okay? And that's true for the subject and object relationship, okay? The internal nature of the subject and object relationship is still to express love. It's heart, okay? So external relationships are exemplified by give and take action, give and receive action. And in that give and receive action, the subject initiates love, and the object returns love and joy. That's driven by the universal prime force, which is that internal directive nature, the inherent directive nature of heart, the desire to express love. Okay? So, God's original plan for us to be able to express love was the three blessings, okay? The three blessings are expressed in human relationships because humans are intended to most uh, substantially reflect our heavenly parents' nature. These three blessings expand God's love vertically through time eternal and horizontally through infinite relationships, okay? In plain English, because I love plain English, the three blessings represent internal maturity, individual maturity centering on true love, a good loving family, and a peaceful, harmonious, and loving society. And that requires our individual responsibility, and we have to freely choose to do that. Okay? When people talk about whether or not freedom is important to God, God didn't even stop the fall. So our freedom is incredibly important, and our freedom has responsibility. It also has consequences. So God told people what the three blessings are, and when they fell, he came and told them what the consequences were going to be. Right? He said, the consequences are going to be, life is going to be incredibly hard. Men and women are going to fight each other. The society is going to fight each other. You're going to fight with the earth in order to get what you need. It's just going to become incredibly hard. The consequences are bad. Okay. Key point of the fall, heavenly parents' plan was corrupted and misdirected. And the proper order of life is that our love is directed outwards towards others. The key point of the fall is, is that it turned love inwards. What was the thing that Satan did to Eve? Right? He turned the desire inwards. You want to know for your sake. Okay? And that continued to multiply. So that's why we have this directive from two parents to live for the sake of others. It's such a clear, pithy, easy quote and motto so I love it okay um, this indirection this uh, misdirection of our love inwards 
stunts our growth. So, as we know, it also uh, resulted in many problems from the individual and family. And the four fallen natures that you see at the end of the fall, and you begin to understand how these appear in the world, how our fallen nature works in the world. But re basically, they're all on that key center point, OK? So about turning love back onto ourselves. So we don't see from our heavenly parents' viewpoint anymore. Uh, we want to reverse positions and take dominion. And uh, also centered on that, we want other people to reflect our bad nature because it makes us feel good to see that reflected. Okay, it makes us feel better about ourselves. So we multiply it in others. Okay, the rest of part one. Good job, Justin. Get Justin another hand. The rest of part one is basically setting us up to understand God's providence of restoration. And for me, the divine principle largely is written as a reply to evangelical Christianity, because evangelical Christianity was supposed to unite with true parents and was supposed to come back and lead this providence of restoration. But they were failing. So the divine principle is basically telling Christians, this is what you're, this is what you're supposed to know. This is what you're supposed to do. And so the rest of part one is basically defining the terms that Christians used in their theology and helping them to understand what their purpose is and what they're supposed to do. OK. This is the outline, what we're going to cover. The introduction to restoration includes restoration through indemnity, the foundation for the Messiah, the history of the providence of restoration in me, laying the foundation in our families and the nation through Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, the parallels of history, preparation for the second advent, and the second advent. Whew. Just saying that is difficult. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so this is what we're supposed to cover, and we now have 52 minutes. Okay. Oh my goodness, which one of these is the one? That's not it. Definitely not it. Okay, how about this one? Definitely not it. Hmm? Yep, definitely not it. That's the one, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you ap apologies. I have to stand right next to here and not walk around like Brother Justin did because there's a bunch of animations built here, and I can't figure out how to turn them off. I hate animations. I also hate the color scheme, but anyway. Here we go. So the providence of restoration means that God is working in human history to restore us. What did we learn in the beginning? The meaning of restoration means salvation. It means resurrection. It means that we have to bring things back to the original condition. If things aren't back to the original condition, then the process of salvation is not complete. So if we're not back to the place where we can fulfill the three original blessings, we're not complete in our salvation. OK. Let's see. I think that's it. So. The process of recreation has to be in accordance with God's principle. And one of the main points is, is that this has to be accomplished through our voluntary work. We have to accomplish it. Hmm. So the restoration and perfection of fallen people has these four steps. 
okay? Basically, when Adam and Eve fell, we fell to a level lower than Adam and Eve were at the beginning of creation, and the process, the uh, history of restoration have been, has been one of helping people get back to that by separating for Satan, from Satan, by removing our original sin, continuing to grow, and fulfilling the purpose of creation. Okay, so, uh, before the fall, we're supposed to grow to be one in heart with God. After the fall, we're not. So, the job is to get back to that position of being one in heart with God. So, how can we do that? The point is, or uh, the, the question is, how can we do that? And the idea is establishing indemnity conditions. Okay, so indemnity conditions can have equal, lesser, or greater prices. So, basically, hmm, if you break a window, if you break a window, then you can pay an equal price and replace the window. A lesser price is to say, I'm sorry, and the person who has the window goes, I know you are, okay, don't worry about it, okay? And a greater price is, you break the window and you run away, and then the police come and they give you a ticket for doing that, and they charge you for the window, okay? So, we have to be able to get back to our original state, and we can do that by establishing indemnity conditions. So who does that? We do. We reverse the course. And who has to do it? We do, like I said. Okay. Uh, I want to go back for a second. So, the basic point of an indemnity condition, hmm? It must be in here. I'll, I'll hold on for a minute. All right. So, what was lost at the time of the fall? The purpose of the growing period was that Adam followed God's commandment during the growth period. He learned to perfect his love, directed outwards towards living for the sake of others. Okay? And Upon that foundation of faith, then you can become one of God. So you have a foundation of faith, perfection of your individual maturity, maturity and that results in a foundation of, faith, of substance of being one with God. Both of those were lost, and the purpose of creation wasn't realized. So to reverse that, we have to establish the foundation of faith and substance. And that is the foundation to receive the Messiah. We have some idea of the Messiah because we studied Christology in part one. Okay. This is the indemnity condition. What do we need to have for an indemnity condition? We need a central figure, a condition, and a numerical time period. I like to put that in plain English again. What that means is, you need a time period in which to accomplish your goal, a goal, and a central figure who will keep you on track. True parents often had indemnity conditions. Their central figure had to be themselves. Nobody else had done it before. But we're in a position where we can find somebody who's been there before, who's done it before, who's closer to the goal than we are, and they can help us to keep on track and do it better and faster. So, central figures for us outside of ourselves are actually important. They say this is the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. So back to it. What was the fallen nature? 
Anybody? The, that's one of the manifestations of our original fallen nature, but the original fallen nature is directing love inwards towards ourselves, so loving ourselves and not loving others. Okay? So the foundation of substance is the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. What it really is, what it really means, is to learn to love others. I like plain English. To remove the fallen nature, it means to learn to love others before we love ourselves. So, key points. The goal of history, restore God's original ideal. Restoration requires conditions of indemnity. The two conditions of indemnity are the foundation of faith. So putting that in plain English again. The foundation of faith is the restoration of your own individual self. That you're learning to love God and learning to love others. United mind and body, centered on true love. Okay? And the foundation of substance is to make that a reality in your relationships with other people. In plain English. Okay? Indemnity condition in plain condition in plain English. Okay, the foundation to receive the Messiah. The foundation of faith is the work necessary to restore myself. The foundation of substance is the work necessary to restore our relationships with each other. Ah. Indemnity is defined as restoring what was lost. That means we make efforts to restore what was lost. Indemnity condition means making a goal, accomplishing that goal, helping or making it happen faster by finding somebody who can teach you and help you keep on track. Okay? Uh, this last part. If you've established the foundation of substance, why is it important? Because we can't go to heaven alone. Okay? We can't go to heaven alone. We have to, we have to bring everybody with us. In fact, it's not really heaven if anybody's left out. Okay. This wasn't in the slides at all. The providence of the restoration in me. So it's like a two-thirds of a page summary at the end of the introduction to restoration. Okay. As an individual, each one of us is a, prov a product of the providence of restoration. So everything that God's done up until now has culminated in us and in our time. Okay? So it's up to us in our lifetime, through my efforts, it's up to me, through my efforts to do that. To fulfill the indemnity conditions which have accumulated. Okay? And so I like to make a point Many are called, but few are chosen. I got this, I think, from Archbishop Stallings. Okay? The point being, many are called. Actually, everybody's called. Why are few chosen? Because you have to choose. You have to make the choice to answer the call. That's your personal responsibility. Okay? Responsibility. Once you're aware of it, you're already responsible. You can try to hide from your responsibility. You can deny your responsibility. You can try not to choose it, but the, re re the reality is, is you're already responsible. And that's why I say you can run, but you can't hide. You already have the responsibility. Okay. The providence to lay the foundation for restoration. 40 minutes, I can do it. Okay. We'll come back to this. When I wrote this, I was like, what's that, what's that verse say exactly? But basically the point is because Heavenly Parent lets us know what to do and expect through the examples of history, okay? And so this part of history is talking about the biblical stories. 
the providence of restoration in Adam's family, God wasted no time in trying to restore humanity. He went immediately to the family of Adam and tried to set up the conditions to restore the foundation to receive the Messiah. Okay? He helped Abel and Cain make efforts to establish a foundation of faith. But because Cain is not evil, but he's closer to evil, to Satan. Because of that, his condition didn't quite work, but that was setting him up to make the foundation of uh, substance, okay? And so, I think I said this last time, and I've probably said it a few times in my sermons, the foundation of substance. Father talks a lot about the responsibility of Abel, right? But the absolute reality is that no matter what Abel does, if Cain chooses not to unite, so it's your responsibility in any relationship that you are, you should just assume that it's my responsibility to try to unite. However, you can't leave your position and do something unprincipled in order to unite. Okay? You can't do that. You have to stay focused on the principle. So just a quick point, people are sometimes saying, why doesn't mother go to Hyunjin or Hyunjin or whoever, you know, why doesn't she go to them? Why doesn't she go to them and unite with them? Because that's not her position. She can't do that. She can't leave her position. It's breaking the principle. They have to come to her. She leaves the door open all the time. All right, the foundation of faith. Ah, it's gonna go on. Here's a bunch of these. Okay. The foundation of faith. We did this already, we talked about that. So the central figure is able, sacrificial offering is the condition, okay, and Abel was successful, Cain wasn't not. The foundation of substance would have required Cain to unite with Abel and go to Abel and say, you were successful, what can I do to be like that? So sometimes we talk about how Abel was kind of haughty and arrogant and that kind of turned Cain off, maybe so. You're going to meet a lot of people like that in your life. So you got to be able to go over that. Anyway, we got the idea. Cain killed Abel. It broke the foundation of substance. So there was a foundation of faith that was laid. Now we're off to Noah's family. Oh, I hate animations. <sighs> Okay, so Noah's family, the foundation of faith required Noah to build an ark and go through the indemnity period, but actually the indemnity period was a lot longer. How long was that? 120 years, right? That's what it says. 120 years it took him to build that ark, and the whole time he was being ridiculed by his family and his friends and his neighbors and his community. What the heck are you doing? All right, so he had a long time, and then he had to go through the flood judgment. And that established the foundation of faith. The foundation of substance goes back to Cain and Abel, required Shem and Ham to be able to inherit from their parents in the position of God who laid the foundation of faith, the foundation of faith and substance. But Ham was faithless in his father, didn't believe in his father, didn't, you know, criticized him from a position of that viewpoint, and broke the foundation. So then we go through Abraham's family, and I just skipped over that whole thing because we know the story, okay? So key points in this history is Adam's family made a foundation of faith, but not a foundation of substance. Noah made the foundation of faith, but his son didn't inherit it. 
Abraham initially failed the foundation of faith, but together with Isaac established a foundation of faith, so Isaac inherited. Isaac passed that down to Jacob, and Esau didn't like that arrangement. He left, was going to kill Jacob. This was the first time where we get the foundation of substance substantially filled on the family level. Okay? We know the story of how he did that, right? How important it is. Why? Why didn't God send the Messiah right away? We have the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. Because during that time period, humanity had expanded to fill an entire world. So God had to move from the family level up to the national level. And that's what he did through Moses and Jesus. So, hmm, I skipped right over Moses again. <laughs> okay, actually, so we went over, the key point is, is that God does not do anything without his prophets to give us the message of how to keep it going, right? How to do it. Central figures. So, without a microphone, Jacob and Esau was a symbolic level of the family, the restoration to receive the Messiah. Moses was the image level. So if you study Moses' course, which, like so much of the principle, could fill weeks instead of minutes, um, then you would see that this, this, uh, this uh, restoration of the national level through Moses, both of these set the pattern for Jesus. Okay, and so you see Jesus going through a similar course of establishing a foundation of faith in order to subjugate Satan, to be the Messiah. Okay, and that gives us a foundation on the worldwide level. Okay, so the foundation for the Messiah was laid, and um, we should talk about the fact that it went through three, three, uh, three levels, right? The original foundation of faith, we learned from the chapter on uh, Christ as the Messiah, the purpose of the Messiah, that John the Baptist and Jesus were supposed to establish both together a foundation of faith and a foundation of substance. But John the Baptist failed that. So, there's no foundation to go before God together. Also remember, John the Baptist already had a foundation of thousands of people. So, if John the Baptist had united, he would have brought all of those people. And he would have brought the attention of the whole nation of Israel to Jesus. But that was lost. So now Jesus had to go through the 40 days in the wilderness, reestablish the foundation of faith, find his own disciples, reestablish a foundation of substance with his disciples, and then go forward. However, again, the disciples weren't faithful, so that was lost. But through the resurrection, Jesus was able to reestablish that foundation of faith with his disciples and establish a spiritual condition so that we could go forward. So now we have the perfected Adam on earth, and he's established a foundation of faith and a foundation of substance with his disciples, the church. So the point is, this foundation is already secure in a sense, but there's something left. What was left? What was left was the actual total restoration of the original ideal. You need true parents first. So there was no true Eve. So this should be emphasized from the very beginning. The reality is, why is there a second coming? 
The whole reason for a second coming is not to bring Jesus back. It's to complete the salvation physically on the earth of establishing true parents, and that requires a true Eve. Okay. Key points, Jesus made three attempts, first through John the Baptist, second through the disciples, third through the resurrection. Jesus' mission is to build God's kingdom on earth, but that was delayed until the second coming. So now, we're talking about, again, God does nothing without telling us through his prophets how to do it. And he arranges the same sets of circumstances in history to make that a reality. So this next part of the uh, second part of uh, divine principle is about how God has worked in history. And so we show how God set up the foundation to receive uh, the first, or the, the, the perfected Adam through biblical history. And now we're going to show from biblical history to this time how that same history is repeated to establish the foundation to bring the Messiah again. Still got 30 minutes. OK. Animation. <sighs> no. <laughs> Okay, there we are. Go forward. Go forward. Forward. Okay, so that's what we just said. Basically, that God is setting up the same events, the same conditions in human history. So we have a pattern that we can look at from the biblical history. Now we have a pattern that we can see repeating itself. It gives us a prediction of when Christ returns. So we need to make a foundation to receive the Messiah again. So we need the three conditions necessary for the foundation of faith. We need to make uh, the three conditions. Central figure, the condition, the numerical time period. OK. And we need to make a foundation of substance. Mm -hmm. So God's providence is to restore his original ideal. It's prolonged due to the failure of us. OK, uh, now we're at the point where I already talked about. The point is, is that um, God repeated the same thing. The first time he did it through, after uh, Jacob and Esau, he did it through the nation of Israel. OK, and that's the Old Testament history. Now, Jesus told the people of Israel, he can raise up another people, chosen people, from the rocks of the earth. So he doesn't need to go through all of that again to get chosen people. He's got Christians. So now we need to go through the history of Christianity to see that it's similar. And we see similar time periods. And to go through all of these time periods would take like forever, certainly a couple hours. So I'm not going to go through that. But the basic point is, is that the time period from Jacob to Moses 400 years, the time from Jesus to Augustine. Augustine really helped define Christianity in much the same way that Moses began to define the chosen people through the Ten Commandments. Then we have uh, nations coming up. Saul, Charlemagne, divided nations, divided kingdoms. Then we get to the time period to prepare for the Second Advent. So that was well, actually, the first advent was Malachi. So we see the book of Malachi in uh, 
the Old Testament. And basically, Malachi's purpose was to revive the faith, that the faith had become corrupted, that it had become a power base for people, that they were misusing it for their own wealth and for their own glory. And so his purpose was to reform it and bring it back to the original purpose. Luther did the same thing. So this began, begins a period for the preparation of the second advent, just as it did with Malachi. Okay, the basic point is, is that we want to establish God's ideal society. So, Father taught us the ideals of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. This is God's ideal. We're supposed to live together in a society like that. And the divine principle uses the word heavenly socialism, and I have trouble with that because so many people think of socialism and they think, Bernie Sanders! Okay. Or they think, uh, Karl Marx! Marx. Or et cetera. Okay. But the divine principle is very clear. The heavenly socialism is like nothing we've ever seen in human history on earth. There is no example of it. Okay. It's different. And the first difference is, it has to be based on free will. We have to be responsible, mature individuals who can live in a society like that without force. Okay? And that's why the divine principle actually goes through this and they make the point that this is different from communism. Okay, and socialism, democratic socialism even, or even is just communism light. It's kind of like a step towards that. And they're happy to get the step towards it. So, God wants people to live in that heavenly society. And what do we call that heavenly society instead of a socialist state? Chanoguk. So it does have a new name. Um, the kingdom of heaven on earth, John El Guk. So Satan mimics God's providence in advance. The satanic side has advocated scientific socialism based on dialectical and historical materialism and has built the communist world. So let's be clear what dialectical materialism is. It means that the kingdom, well, not the kingdom, but the ideal state comes about through conflict, not cooperation. That's what the dialectic means at the root, that you're going to reach this ideal harmonious society through conflict and through force. OK? And. They've replaced the idea of God's providence of restoration with the idea that there's some unseen, unknown force that you have to have faith in. Who knows what it is, but it's just driving history that way. Okay, it's going to happen because that's the direction of history. Why? No reason. You have to have faith. Okay. So the point is, is that Satan's given his ideal ahead of God. So his ideal is communism and scientific socialism. And instead of advancing humanity, it actually drags us back. OK, the next point of this is that the new truth of divine principle, this new expression of truth, is going to give us the material that allows us to unify and make better these three key areas okay, of politics, religion, and economy.
So, the religion founded upon this truth will lead us all to become one with God in heart. And we'll build an economy in accordance with that ideal. And we provide the foundations for a new political order to realize the ideal of creation. Politics is, by the way, just the art of people getting together and negotiating what we're going to do together based on mutually shared values. Okay, a desire for co prosperity and our acknowledgement of our interdependence. Hmm. So with religion, one with God and heart, economy, in accordance with the divine ideal, politics, to realize the ideal of creation. So this is the messianic kingdom built on principles of interdependence, interdependence, mutual prosperity, and shared values. Key points. Purpose of Jewish and Christian, Christian history is to establish the foundation for the Messiah. So the key point is all of Old Testament history was to establish the foundation for Jesus. And all of the history since the Old Testament, that's the New Testament history, is to establish the foundation to receive true parents. We see the same patterns happening. Okay, In these last days, and we do know that's the last days from eschatology. Okay, Then Satan's built his kingdom based on scientific socialism and secular humanism that denies God. This is the period of the Reformation, and for some reason it's not complete. Okay, the 100 year period, 30 period, 130 year period of the Reformation, Reformation began in 1517 when Martin Luther raised the banner for Protestant Reformation in Germany. Okay, so this is the beginning of the preparation for the advent to receive the Messiah. The church had become corrupted, and Luther walked up. If anybody knows Luther, he wasn't a perfect example of Reformation himself, but he walked up and he said, these are 95 points that I want to question the church on. Okay? And so he began a discussion about that. Okay? They're telling us the time period is 130 years. It lasted to 1648 when uh, the wars between Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism uh, were resolved in the Treaty of Westphalia. Okay, so in the Middle Ages, that's when the corruption happened. We're trying to get back to a restoration of original nature. That's the purpose of the providence of restoration. Luther did that. Now, we need to understand that we still have an internal and external conflict going on. Okay, and therefore there's a king type restoration of original nature and an able type restoration of original nature. And they took place through two different things. So the first one we already talked about was Martin Luther and the Protestant uh, Reformation protesting the corruption of the Catholic Church and the Renaissance. And the Renaissance was um, a more humanistic examination of philosophy and science, trying to find something uh, principled that we could work on together without talking about God and having that come as a point of conflict. However, the core value is of the Reformation is a faith in God, but the core value of the Renaissance was more of uh, the Enlightenment period and a foundation in human, human rationality. So, this conflict continued until the French Revolution in 1789. So the French Revolution was largely led by people who were atheistic. They didn't like the church. The Protestant church in, in uh, France at the time wasn't extremely strong. It was mostly the Catholic church, and they attacked the church very strongly and destroyed a lot of it. <sighs> Animations. <sighs> So 
So the point is, after these two things, we're left with freedom again. Freedom of thought and freedom of faith. And it's confusing because we have a history where we don't really know and understand God. So a lot of people have their own ideas and they began to fight about it. Okay? So we couldn't get away from these divisions of theology and disputes among philosophies. And that finally bore fruit Okay, so we're looking for freedom of faith and thought, the external desire, internal desire. Hmm. Point being is that these things represent Cain, external, and Abel, internal. And they divided into two camps, the materialistic and the, and the faithful. Okay, so we have a Cain type world and an Abel type world. This is an old map now. So, the Cain type world has to submit to the Abel type world to establish the worldwide foundation of substance. Did Gorbachev submit to the Abel type world? Did he? More or less. More or less. <laughs> And in fact, some people are arguing right now that Russia is actually more able than the United States, but we'll let that discussion go elsewhere. Okay, worldwide foundation of substance is the unity between these two. So we've established that through uh, Russia as the representative of the Cain world uh, submitting to the West without conflict, without war. So a lot of this is talking about whether or not the Third World War is in substance of actual physical conflict is necessary or not. And the answer of that is, is that not as is at the level of World War I and World War II. We're gonna talk about World War I and World War II. Hmm. Period of maturation of politics, economy, and ideology. So during that time period, basically we had the democracies of the East rising and totalitarian systems based on scientific socialism arising on the other side and culminating actually in 1918 with the start of World War I. Okay. So, the Cain-type view of life was solidified with the French Revolution, establishing a Cain-type democracy, which is actually pretty totalitarian, and the communist world. The Abel-type view of life with the Puritan Revolution, culminating in the Abel-type democracies of Britain and America and the democratic world centered on those. And now we're at the world wars. So the world wars are the attempt to reconcile this conflict. They, uh, I'm gonna talk real quick, it's not in the slides, about war and conflict. My viewpoint, and I think I can make a pretty good principled case for this, is war has to be seen always as human failure. The first principle of God and his desire for us is that we're one in heart with him. So when Father talks about absolute faith and absolute love and absolute obedience, when we have absolute faith and absolute love, we're one in heart with God, so the obedience part the absolute obedience part becomes really natural. We have the same desires, the same outlooks, and we go in that direction. Okay? So the first desire of God is, is that we have true love and understanding. And so we naturally follow what's right. Okay? What happens when people don't do that? 
then God establishes law. Humans apply force to make the law, but God tells people this is what the law is. Okay? So he establishes law, truth and law. So now the understanding is imposed from outside. This is what you're supposed to do. And so he asks you to have faith in that. Okay? So the first level is he wants you to have love and faith is the second level. And the third level happens when that doesn't go right. And at that point, then we start to fight. We have physical conflict between those who are closer to God and those who are farther away from God. So every war has to be seen as human failure. It's not God's will. It's never God's will. That being said, then what we see in the world wars is that these human failures are huge, but at the end, if God's side is victorious, then God can claim that and bring everybody, all of humanity, closer to the ideal. Okay? So, what are the internal providential, external and internal providential causes? Okay, so the external causes that we study in history are about conflicts of politics, economics, and ideology. The internal causes are about bringing God's providence of restoration closer to fulfillment. Okay? So what can we see about the world wars? Uh, there we go. The world wars are Satan's last desperate struggle to hold on to his people, okay? The world wars are indemnity conditions to restore the three great blessings. And they overcome the three temptations of Jesus, which are also based on the three great blessings. And to restore God's sovereignty. The providential results for the first world war it was a victory of God's side. And so we defeated the people who were persecuting Christianity. And we upheld Christianity. That gives us the foundation for the birth of the returning Christ. True parents. It's the formation stage of the dispensation for the second advent. I got six minutes. I'm almost done. Okay. Providential results for the Second World War. Again, we upheld Christianity and we defeated the Satan's satanic side. So that gives us the growth stage of the dispensation for the Second Advent. So the birth of the Messiah, and now this is the providence for the actual life course of the Messiah to start. So now we still have the two camps. Well, actually, we've defeated communism, but there's still two camps. But they're both religious. So are we going to have a third war? If you know the history, the reality is, is we did fight a third war. There was a lot of actual conflict. People died. Okay. But it never grew into this kind of worldwide conflict that we had before. We were able to keep it contained. And it's a good thing, because the worldwide conflict would have likely involved atomic weapons. Although, a good case can be made that it never went to a worldwide conflict because of atomic weapons. People backed off from it. Hmm. The providential results of our third world war. God won victory in the three world wars. So now we're on a path to realize God's ideal world. Key points, 
of this. There's 400 years since 1517 until 1917. That's the First World War time period. That was the providence for the birth of the returning Christ. Okay, World War II. Uh, World War II was the providence for the start of the Messiah's mission. World War III resolved. Father did a lot in terms of uh, embracing the other side and allowing that to happen peacefully. Now we're at the second advent. And the, the point of this is, again, this is to explain to Christians the reality of Father's position. So, Jesus clearly told people, I'm coming back, but no one knows when. However, we still have we still have Amos 3.7 Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants. Okay. So the point is, is that even though they may be cryptic, they're known if we decipher it. Okay? So, God gives prophecies to us to help us understand when will Christ return? We've got that down now, right? After 1917. So, as we noted, these are the last days. Today is the last days. Two minutes and 55 seconds left. So at the end of 1917, we began the period of the second advent. How will Christ return? Christians believe in the clouds. Okay, but the Bible notes that when he comes, he'll be persecuted and condemned and he'll have trouble to find faith on the earth and as we note that anybody that comes down in glory from heaven on the clouds is going to be recognized. So you're going to have a hard time finding anybody who can deny who true parents are. So the point is, is that he has to be born in the flesh. And it's also um, similar to the way that uh, John the Baptist came back as Elijah. Right? He came back born in the flesh. So we have more to look at to show that to be true. So how will he come as a physical person born on the earth? Where? It says he'll be born among the Jewish people. Hmm. However, in Matthew 21, 33 through 43, Jesus clearly conveyed that he would not come among the Jewish people because their position would be taken away from them because of faithlessness. And therefore, they'll come to another people. So who are the other people? The chosen people after the crucifixion. And therefore, Christ will come back to Christians, not to Jewish people. Where? He'll return to a nation in the east. So, the divine principle talks about there are three nations thought of as being in the east. Korea, Japan, and China. And it talks of the reasons why uh, China became communist, Japan became fascist. Those two countries couldn't receive the Messiah. Also, they've both been countries that have warred a lot. Korea's been a peaceful nation. Neither of those nations accepted Christianity strongly, but Korea did. So therefore, that's why Korea is the nation where Christ will return. That says I'm done. Almost. 
All right, so um, interesting uh, Korea's history. If you look at Korea's history, they trace it back to 5,000 years. And if you look at what Dongun preached and, and uh, or the history that uh, Koreans teach about what Dongun uh, promoted, it sounds a lot like the kingdom of heaven. So even 5,000 years ago, the Korean people were founded on that kind of basis. There were many predictions of Korea being the nation to where Christ would return. So this is talking about uh, this special book of prophecy. Also, all of the different founders, all of the different religions in Korea, the uh, members receive uh, revelations that the founders of their religion will return to Korea. Okay, so the key points for the coming of Christ, when, after World War I, how, as a man born on the earth, where, from Korea. And that is the end. <laughs>